Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 195 for the 6th of Sivan and Alipir. So this is the episode for Shavuos. So I'm pre-recording this episode. And so those of you who are listening before Shavuos, I hope you have a very nice Shavuos. Those of you listening after the holiday, I hope you had a nice Shavuos. And so here we go. So very exciting today. We're actually going to be beginning a whole new book in the Tanya. So we finished the first book in yesterday's episode, Likutei Amarim, and today we're starting a whole new section. It's called, it's the section of Shara HaYichod Ve'amuna. This is the gate of unity and understanding. It's a really cool section of the Tanya that really deals with the spiritual underpinning of our world, of all of creation, gives us a little bit more of an understanding of God, at least in so far as we can understand him. And today we are actually going to be looking at the introduction to this section. And the introduction is a book in its own right. It's called Chinuch Katan, which literally means the education of the of, of the child, of the youth. And so what this section deals with and that we're going to be learning about is how we should go about educating our children in the ways of Chabad Chasadis. In this pathway and as we'll come to learn is when we talk about educating children not only is this meant in a literal sense but it actually is speaking to ever each and every one of us as well because really each one of us are also considered children like we never really go beyond that level of being a child in a certain sense as as we'll see and one of the interesting things about this section as well as you'll see in in learning this section is even though it's featured after in the present form. Originally, when the Alter Rebbe was putting together the Tanya, he originally intended for this section to actually precede Likutei Amram. And so this is why we'll see in certain parts of the section, the Alter Rebbe will say things like, we will learn this in the future, coming up soon, kind of thing. So now this section that we're going to be learning today, this Chinuch Katan, it's going to be centered around a certain citation from Mishle, which talks about how the way to educate a person when they're young is in such a way so that this education that you give them will not depart from them when they get older, which at first glance sounds kind of strange because it seems to imply that when we, you know, if you think about how you teach preschoolers, for example, you teach them in a very specific way that is appropriate to that age group. But once they get older, then... (laughs) Hopefully, you're going to teach them in a slightly different way, in a slightly more mature and sophisticated way based on the development of their brains. So we're going to try to understand what it means that like this education that we give to the preschoolers, for example, which appears to be like this dumbed down form of education, what's the value in having older children or even adults keep this in mind for the rest of their lives. So like, what is the value of this like early childhood education that we want to instill in our children's and specifically in ourselves? So by way of introduction to get into this topic and have a little bit of a deeper understanding of this topic, I thought it would be interesting to talk to you guys a little bit about my Ashtanga yoga practice, which I know I've brought up previously on the podcast. And I really felt like it was very relevant to the topic at hand today, specifically about the first time I entered into the Ashtanga Yoga Studio where I began practicing that very first day. So let me take you back then. That was about four years ago. And for context, I had actually been practicing other types of yoga, regular yoga, so to speak, uh, for a good while, for about 20 years, mostly centered around power yoga. The main class that I would attend, pretty much the only class that I was attending at that point, was this power yoga class in a very prestigious kind of yuppie-like studio in Manhattan, which was like a, considered to be a very advanced kind of yoga class. 
where at this yoga studio, they, they would have different, they would divide up the schedule in terms of the levels of the classes. So you had some classes which were level one, this was for beginners. Then you had some classes which were labeled as level two. This was for students that were like a little bit more experienced in yoga. Then you had classes that were labeled at levels two, three. These, this was for the students who were, who were considered to be a little bit more advanced, you know, had a good deal of yoga experience under their belt and were really looking for a challenge. And then you had this one class that was labeled as level three, just one class on the studio. This was power yoga level three. And this was the class that I attended. <laughs> so this was just to give you an idea of like where I was at in my yoga journey thus far, before coming into Ashtanga. And this power yoga class was a great class. It was tons of fun. It was really challenging. And we were sort of like our own little club there. And I have to say, we were somewhat of an elitist club in the sense that we really never went to any other yoga class other than this class. We sort of looked down on other yoga classes as not being challenging enough, not being exciting enough. And we kind of prided ourselves on what we were able to do, that we were able to do all these like back bends and handstands and splits and stuff like that, that like weren't necessarily being done in other classes or that most other yoga students couldn't do. So coming to this Ashtanga yoga studio, which how I got there is a whole, is a story for another time, which I may or may not relate. Maybe I did relate it in another episode. I don't, I don't remember offhand. Anyways, so coming to this new style of yoga, I was really excited because this was a style that I, I decided that I wanted to investigate further. And upon observing it for the first time in the studio, I decided that yes, this was for me. It looks really good. And I, I really wanted to do it and I wanted to give it a try. So I spoke to the teacher and I said, okay, great. I'm ready to start. So what do I do? So the teacher says to me, okay, great. I think you're going to like this a lot. Come back tomorrow at 9 a.m. That's when the beginners show up. And I just looked at him with this look of incredulity. And I said, no, 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 no. I think you have this wrong. I'm, I'm not a beginner. I've been practicing yoga for a really long time. I mean, here I was, I had been practicing yoga at this point for about 20 years. I've been going to this advanced power yoga class for about eight years at this point. I also did gymnastics, contortion, and handstand classes on the side. And so to be labeled as a beginner was really frankly quite insulting. <laughs> um, but the teacher just smiled and said to me, you know, it's really good to always think of yourself as a beginner at any time. And so just come tomorrow at 9 a.m. <laughs> so what could I do? I really had no choice. So leaving quite humbled, somewhat humiliated maybe, I, I left and I came back the next day at 9 a.m. And lo and behold, that first class, maybe the first couple of classes, indeed I was quite bored and I did feel under-stimulated and under-challenged. But soon enough, after just a few classes, I started to realize what was going on. And I started to realize that this was actually a whole new system for me. And indeed, I was a beginner. And indeed, I was being challenged. And I had no idea to what extent I would be challenged and how much so and how much of a beginner I was. And so four years later, here I am. I still practice this style of yoga. And every single day, I see myself being challenged in new ways. I see just how much of a beginner I am and how much I don't know and how much further there is for me to get to. And I think that this is one of the things that I love about the practice is it really does cultivate within me this beginner's mind and this sense of humility and this sense of really like, well, on one hand, it's very empowering because I do see myself advancing day after day after day, simultaneously in this somewhat weird paradox, I also see myself in a more humble state day after day after day as I recognize my weaknesses on a new and deeper level every step along the way. One of the things that I find interesting about the Ashtanga yoga practice is that no matter what level you are at, no matter how long you've been doing the practice, whether it's 20 years, whether it's your first day, whatever it is, we're all practicing the exact same sequence. The sequence doesn't deviate. The difference is it will look very different depending on the level of the practitioner for sure. But the basic sequence and what were the pattern, the, the, the order of the poses is exactly the same. So this reminds me of another story, which I read in a book I, a while back. I can't remember offhand which book it was. I think it was a book about habits maybe, or a business book or something like that. And it contained within it a story about a little league team who had a coach and the coach would bring them for practice 
uh, and they would do different exercises in the practice. And so what, what they would always do is they'd start off the class the same way every time. They would start off by running laps around the track and they would do this for a while for, I don't remember how long, maybe like a good like 10 minutes or so. And then they would do like push-ups and jumping jacks and a whole bunch of different warm-up exercises. And then when they finally got to actually practicing the game itself, like actually playing baseball, that was actually a relatively speaking small portion of the actual class. And so some of the students got pretty frustrated with this and they were really eager to actually play and they felt like that they were being babied in this way. Like they thought to themselves, like, why do we need all these warm ups? And so they spoke to the teacher about it and they complained about the laps that they had to do and all this stuff. And they said, you know, we just really want to play like the big leagues. We, we really are sick of this little league stuff. We want to want to do what the big league teams are doing. So the teacher looks at them and the teacher smiled and he said, oh, really? He said, you would like to play like the big leagues? And they said, yes, yes, we would. So he said, okay, let me take you guys on a field trip. trip." So soon thereafter, the coach arranged for them to go on a field trip to observe a real live baseball team practice. I know absolutely nothing about baseball, so I do not remember which baseball team it was. Let's say it was the Dodgers. It may or may not have been them. I, I don't, I really don't remember, but let's say it was them. So they went to, they were super excited. They get on the bus. They're going to see this, their favorite baseball team uh, practice. This is like a really behind the scenes, once in a lifetime type of thing. And they get there. They're seeing the Dodgers get into gear and everything like that. And what do they do? What do the Dodgers do? They start running laps around the track. <laughs> and so the, they're like, okay. And then after running around the track for a good five, 10 minutes, they start doing jumping jacks and they start doing push-ups, and they start doing all of the same exercises that their coach had taught them to do. And so the coach was like smiling the whole time and like looking at the students and seeing their reactions. And from this experience, the kids understood and they they saw what it was that the teacher was trying to teach them that really, if you want to get to the big leagues, it's the same path. It's the same path for everybody, regardless of level that you're at. You can't cut corners. You can't just wake up one day and now you play baseball. And so no matter what level you're at, you always have to stay humbled. You always have to stick with a beginner's mind. So it's the same principle that I learned in my yoga practice. You know, when I get a new pose, when I learn how to do something new, I don't just like focus on that one new pose and forget everything else. I always have to start at the beginning. I always have to start with my push-ups, with my warm-up. It's it's the same process. It's the same thing that people do day after day after day. So this is a lesson that we're going to be learning today. And this lesson applies not only with physical endeavors and physical disciplines like yoga or baseball or really anything else, but today we're really going to see how this really applies in terms of our service of God, which is really the, the focus of the Tanya. We'll learn about how this deeper meaning of teaching a child according to his ways so that even when he gets older, this doesn't depart from him, is really teaching this exact thing, is that no matter how advanced a person becomes in their Torah study, in their spiritual endeavors and those kind of things, they should never get too comfortable. They should never get to the point of just kind of like thinking that they don't have to work on serving God. And specifically when we talk about serving God, in this context, we're talking about loving God and how to work towards loving God and really making loving God a discipline and a practice, just like one would have la deal with yoga or baseball or anything like that. So let's get into the text. And I think we can explore more as we go and as we get in through it. There's a lot here. It's kind of, uh, it's pretty long. <laughs> the letters are pretty small if you have the safer in front of you. So stick with it, get comfortable and, and let's go. So the Alter Rebbe begins here this section and he starts off with a heading where he says that this is Likutei Amarim, the second part of Likutei Amarim, which is called Chinuch Katan. So this is again, Chinuch Katan is the education of the youth. And the Alter Rebbe says that this is this section has been compiled from different authors and from different books that uh, of people who have passed away, may their souls, their souls are in Gan Eden right now. And it's mainly based upon the very first paragraph in the Shema prayer, which is 
שמע ישראל השם אלוקינו, השם אחד, ברור שם כבוד מלכותו לעולם בעת. So this is an allusion to Sharia Chod Ve'amona, which is going to come up tomorrow. That's when we're going to start the, the proper book. It's really based around that, that the Shema prayer, the very beginning of the Shema prayer, which talks about God's unity um, and, and what that means and in terms of creation and in terms of himself and our relationship with him. But in order to understand this and in order to get there to that, to to beginning with the Shema. Today we're actually going to focus a little bit elsewhere. We're going to focus on a different citation, one that I mentioned in the beginning from Mishlei. So this comes from Mishlei, chapter 22, verse 6, where it says, <laughs> So literally that means, educate a child according to his ways, so that even when he gets older, it will not depart from him. So the Alter Rebbe here asks a question on this. He says, when we say educate a child according to his ways, this is this seems to imply that we're educating him not in a true truthful way. So like I mentioned previously in the introduction, so it's like, think about when you teach a, a preschooler about any subject. Let's say you're teaching the, a preschooler about animals and different types of animals. So this is going to be like very different than if you were to teach like biology students about animals, right? So it's like we're really dumbing down the material in order to suit the preschooler. So it seems to imply that like this, it, we're not giving the preschooler the full picture. So if this is the case, if we're just educating the ch child according to his youth, according to what he's capable of comprehending, comprehending, why do we want them to remember this when they're older? Why, why do we want them to, to this to stick with them when they get older? What's the merit of this? That's the question that the, the altar Rebbe asks. And so now to answer this, the altar Rebbe goes on a Another little tangent here, and he says that to understand this, we know that the source of serving God and the foundation of serving God is fear and love of God, right? So we talked about this previously in Tanya, and we talked about how, why is this? Because the fear of God, this is the source and root of sur mera, of staying away from bad things, from evil things. And ava, love, is the source and root for aseto, for doing the positive commandments and keeping all of the positive commandments, whether it's rabbinical or whether it's biblical, as will be explained later on. So again, when the altar of says, as will be explained later on, this is because originally this section was intended to be before Likutei Amar. So basically just to recap this, and this is again, things we've we learned about previously, is that the source and root of state that that when we're serving god the the whole idea of serving god is keeping the 613 commandments that god gave us and the 613 commandments are divided up into positive commandments like proactive things that we need to do and negative commandments prohibitions things we need to stay away from and the root of keeping the positive commandments is developing our love of God because the more we love God the more we're going to want to proactively serve him and the root of staying away from transgressions and not doing the things that God does doesn't want us to do is fear fear of God because when we fear God when we have a sense of reverence and awe of God this will prevent us from going against God's will and now in brackets then the Alter Rebbe here says that the mitzvah of chinuch, so there's a mitzvah to educate your child, this is chinuch, is also one of the positive commandments, as is written in the Arachayim Siman Shin Mem Gimel. So that's just like a nice little thing that the Alter Rebbe is adding here, is that speaking of positive commandments and negative commandments and serving God and all of that, well, the subject of what we're learning about today is the idea of educating our youth, and that is... Uh, and that is also a positive commandment, which thus we'll see is very much connected to love, as we'll see, loving God. So loving God. So that's that's what the altar is going to get into now. So the altar Rebbe says here that at the end of Parsha's Ekev, then there there's then it what does it say it says and this is written for context it's dvarim chapter 11 verse 22 it says so it says here i meaning god i'm commanding you to do it to love god so the altar Rebbe asks a question about this we have to understand this he says what does this mean to do to love god <laughs> like when we when you love, when we think of love, we think of love as an emotion. It's something I feel. It's not something that I can actively do. I can't tell myself, love this thing. Like if I 
like chocolate, I like chocolate. If I don't like chocolate, I don't like chocolate. And as much as I tell myself, like the chocolate, just like the chocolate, I'm not going to like the chocolate. We only love what we love. So how can we say that there's something proactive about love? So the altar of says to understand this, we have to understand that there are actually two different types of love of God. And so if you've been following on in the podcast episode so far, you probably recognize that there's actually a lot more than two types of love of God. We went through a whole bunch of them throughout our learning. However, in general, they can be placed into two general categories. And this is what the Altar is going to focus on today. So the first one, says the Altar is the idea of the Kaluta Nefesh B'tiv'a, al Bora. So what this means is that this is where the soul naturally wants to expire in its source, in its, in its creator. So how does this happen? This happens when the nefesh hasichlas, the intellectual soul, rises up and overcomes the materiality of the body and it subdues it and, and lowers it. So, and then what happens is that through the subjugation of the body and the materiality, this will ignite a flame which will light up of its own accord and with a lot of excitement. And it will cause the soul to really become very joyous in God and rejoice in God, its maker. And it will derive a lot of pleasure in God and in all of this. So it's really, so this is talking about somebody who is uh, this very spiritual type of person who derives a lot of pleasure and a lot of happiness in God and in, in its creator. And then the altar Rebbe says, who is it that merits this type of feeling, this type of love of God that's on such a high level, which is called Avar Rabbah? These are the Tadikim. And this is alluded to, says the Altar Rebbe, in the verse in Tehillim, which is from Tehillim chapter 97, verse 12, where it says, Simchut Tzadikim Bashem, that the Tzadikim will rejoice in you. So this is not something, says the Altar Rebbe, that every person merits. This is something that is very specific to certain individuals, this high level of love of God, which is like a flame that arises in its own accord. In order to attain this level, we need a very a tremendous amount of refinement of the material on a, to a great extent and also a lot of Torah and a lot of good deeds like a, a like plentiful amount of this like so not something that just like a regular person does we're talking about somebody who's on a very very high level with all of this kind of stuff in terms of the refinement of their bodies and in terms of the amount of Torah they learn the amount of good deeds they do this is what's going to merit a person to receive such a lofty neshama, which the neshama level is higher than the levels of ruach and nefesh. So, and then the altar Rabbi says that this is explained more at length in the Rishit Chochma, in the gate talking about Ava, the Shahava. Okay, so that's level one. That's that's the first type of love that the altar was talking about. Then we have the second type of love. And what's the second type of love? The second type of love is a type of love which every person can attain. And how could they attain it? They could attain it through meditation. When a person really takes the time to really meditate from the depths of their heart about those things which cause them to, which will arouse this feeling of love towards God in every single Jew, this can get them to this level of love. So this makes sense, right? So it's just like when we were talking about chocolate before, so maybe that's not the best example because that's just like a matter of taste. But let's say if we're talking about a person, let's say your spouse, let's say your, chi- your child, your parent, whatever it is, if you want to arouse feelings of love towards a particular individual, if you really take the time to sit and think and use your intellect about all the good things about them, all the things that you really appreciate about them, the good things that they've done for you, this most likely is going to arouse feelings of love in you towards them, right? And so the altar of says that this is exactly what we need to do in terms of God in order to arouse the second level of love, which we can all attain. So, and what is the meditation about? Like how, how, what kind of things should we be meditating upon to get to this level of loving God? So first of all, we can meditate in a, in a ge- general way. So this is called Der Klal in Hebrew. And that, and this general meditation is if we really think about the fact that God is our actual life force. And just like every person loves their self, their soul and their life, thus they should love God when they really focus on the facts that the tr- within their heart that H- Hashem is their true nefesh, their true soul, and their true life. 
as is written in the Pasuk, uh, as as the Zohar explains on the Pasuk, Nafshi Iviticha Begomel. So this is from Yeshayahu chapter 26, verse 9, where it says, My soul, I desire you. So what is the soul that we desire? This is God, really, because God is the source of our soul. So we had discussed this in previous episodes. We actually had a whole episode about this idea, about how one way that we can tap into a certain natural love of God that we all have as Jews is by recognizing how much we love our lives and ourselves and how much we don't want to die and we want to stay alive. Because when we really tap into that in a real way, we can start to recognize that really God is our ultimate life. God is truly the source of our lives. We are nothing without God. He's the one sustaining us. So if we love our lives so much, really the logical translation of this is that we will love God. So this is the general meditation we can do in this like very kind of like general sense and think about like God in this way of being the source of all life. And then another type of meditation we can do, teaches the Alter Rebbe, is in a more particular way. This is Der Prat. When a person really will think about and meditate upon the greatness of God in a very particular way. And so what this means is that we really, it's it's about really expanding our intellect and really using our intellect to its fullest ability and really taking the time to meditate in detail and like analyze, like it's sort of like if you wanted to really understand like a scientific paper and you wanted to understand all the nuances that are contained within that scientific paper and every detail, every statistic. So this is what we're trying to do when we talk about the particular way of like meditating upon God in this very particular manner to really use our intellect to its fullest extent and even try to reach above our intellect. And so this type of meditation that we do in this particular way, so when we meditate upon God in this particular way, like thinking about God in all of his particularities, like basically learning chassidus, which is what we're doing right now, then this will this can then lead to meditating upon God's great love for us. So this great God that we learn about in Hasidus and in all these details, and we develop this like certain like appreciation for who God is and to the extent of our ability to understand and also to realize that what we don't understand, then we start to realize that this amazing great God, he came from his lofty place and he went down into Egypt, which is called Ervat Aretz. This is like the lewdness of the earth, like the lowest, Egypt was really thought about thought of being the lowest point of the earth, the most impure place of the earth. And he took our souls out of the iron crucible. It's called the Kura Balzel, which is really, this is an allusion to the Sitra Achra, Rahman and Islam. This is the, the other side. Like basically when we were trapped in Egypt, we were considered to be in the lowest of low states. It wasn't just about our physical enslavement by the Egyptians, but we actually, spiritually speaking, we were in a state of like very, very low, very low impurity. And what did God do? God took us out. He came down to that place of the low impurity and he took us out of there to bring us close to him and to have us cleave to his soul, his his name. And when we say his name, him and his name are one. So he wanted us really to be connected to, to to him, to the extent that he actually elevated us from the lowest depths of impurity to the highest points, to the utmost level of Kedusha, of holiness, and to the point of where to his greatness, there's no end and there's no limit. And so when we really think about this, when we really think about how much God loves us, to what extent he went down to redeem us out of Egypt, then we'll have this experience of kemaim hapanim el hapanim. So this is a verse from Mishle, chapter 27, verse 19, which we had spoken about before. We, again, we had a whole episode about this, about this idea that if you look into water, if you it, then what you'll see in the water is your own face because the water reflects whatever it is that's looking at it. And so this is similar to how our expressions work with men. Like we mirror each other so that it's like when we look at another person and we see that that other person loves us, this is going to arouse within us feelings of love. So when we recognize how much God loves us, this will reckon, this will bring out feelings of love within ourselves for God as well. And so this is exactly what the altar says, is he says that this meditation and contemplation upon the particularities of God and how this great God came and redeemed us out of Egypt and out of this impurity, this will arouse within us feeling that within every single person who thinks in this way and through the depths of their heart, feelings of love for God. And it, this will arouse a very intense feeling of love of God so that we'll want to cleave to God with our heart and with our soul 
as will be explained at length in its place. And so, again, this is a reference to the first section of Tanya, Tanya Likutea Marm, specifically chapters 46 and 49. So you can go back and review if you'd like, but this is the whole idea. So that it's this is a way that we can get to this level of love through our own capacities. So now the Altruppa says that this type of love that we've been discussing, this type of love that comes about through our own meditation and contemplation is something that Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to implant in the hearts of every single Jewish person. And we see this where he says, this is taken from Dvarim, where he says, Yisrael So the rest of that pasuk is, Yisrael ma Hashem Hashem um, This is taken from Dvarim chapter 10, verse 12, where it says, what does God ask of you? guys to love and fear him and so and we had spoken about this at length is it any small thing to love and fear god it's it's a big deal but this is really the type of love that that Moshe Rabbeinu was asking of the jewish people to have is this type of love that is based on that comes about through meditation and contemplation upon god and then there's a few other psukim also that uh, that allude to this so there's hen la shem so this is this is talking about God's greatness. So this is uh, also from Devarim, chapter 10, verse 14. And then there's a few other verses too that, that the altar recites that are also from Devarim that talk about how God only wanted our forefathers and he circumcised them and he took us into Egypt, the 70 souls into Egypt. And so all of this, so talking about all the, God's relationship with us and how God specifically chose us and God specifically descended into Egypt for us. And so then the conclusion of all of this is that that you should love God. So thus we see that Moshe Rabbeinu was teaching the Jewish people how to love God through this meditation, through this type of understanding that of really trying to recognize who God is and what God did for us and hopefully having this lead to this arousal of love within us. And so this is why now we can understand why it is that the, that Moshe Rabbeinu concluded this whole section of love, saying, "Asher nochim etzavet etchem la'sota," that what that which I commanded you to do. So I commanded you to love God. So this is again a very practical type of love that comes about in the heart through bina, through understanding and das and and knowledge about those things which arouse feelings of love towards God. And we see that uh, that Hashem actually gave this commandment through Moshe Rabbeinu previous in the Shema prayer, where it says, That these words which I command you to this day shall be upon your heart. So again, there's this connection between the heart loving and a commandment which now we can understand because through this contemplation and meditation this can lead to loving god as is explained in sifre so sifre talks about this verse and the the commentary sifre talks about this and and talks about this connection between how to bring about love through action and so thus now we can understand how this second type of love this love that it applies to every person we can attribute the lashon, the language of a mitzvah and a commandment to, you because this is something that we can, well, we can't necessarily tell somebody to love somebody, like feel this feeling in their heart, like in this automatic way. Every person has the ability to, to focus their heart and mind upon things that will arouse love. So it's like we have, we may not have the choice to change how we feel in the moment, but we do have the choice as to what to focus on. So it's, you know, this is a common thing that comes up even in modern day psychology. People talk about how love is a verb, you know, and that if you act loving towards your partner, this will arouse feelings of love in you. So there are really practical things we can do. Like we can focus on the good in our partner. We can focus on the bad in our partner. And depending on what we focus on, this will change our feelings. So in this case, and when we really focus on God in the proper way, this can actually arouse feelings of love. However, the altar of it goes back and he says, but the first type of love that we talked about initially, this type of love that, that's like a flame that arises of its own accord, we can't say that this is a mitzvah or that this is a commandment because it's something which just is, it's given as a reward to tzaddikim so that they will have a taste of the world to come. And this is alluded to in 
a, in a verse in Bamidbar, chapter 18, verse 7, where it says, Avodat matana etenet kilnatchem, that I shall grant you a priestly service as a gift. So as will be explained further at length, says the altar Rabbi. So basically this is, again, it's talking about the idea that this first type of love that we talked about is not something which can be commanded because it's something which just, uh, which comes about as a reward for a person refining themselves and working on themselves and working on their connection with God to such a high extent. Okay, so now the altar is going to pivot a little bit and he's going to get into something which I find personally speaks to me in such a deep way in terms of really uh, a lot of how I tend to try to live my life. And this is a verse from Mishlei, chapter 24, verse 16, where it says, Ki sheva yipol tzadik fakam. So what this means is that a tzadik may fall seven times, yet rises again. And then the altar Rebbe says that this is uh, especially so because we see that a person is called a mahalach and not an omed. So the, a person is called a walker, somebody who walks and not somebody who stands. So meaning that a person needs to be constantly moving from level to level and not just stand statically in one place forever. And so, okay, so we, ha we have to <laughs> break this down. We have to understand what the altar is talking about here. So first of all, the altar is discussing the idea that a person, the 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 nature of a person and what makes us a person as opposed to an angel, for example. So angels are called umdim. Angels are called those who stand because they just stay in one place and they don't, they're, they're, they're very static. They're stuck in whatever place they're at, whatever purpose that God set up for them. Versus humans, on the other hand, are called mahalchim, walkers, people who walk. They, they're going, they're moving. So we're always fluctuating. We're very dynamic creatures as our nature and hopefully we're moving higher and higher throughout our lives and trying to get better and improve ourselves right and but what's interesting about this so what's this whole idea about like the, the tzaddik falling seven times and rising up and all of that so the alt so at first this could sound like on superficial glance that this means that oh, okay the tzaddik just keeps messing up keeps making mistakes and then they get back up again well this is true also and this is a way that we need to live our lives definitely is that as we live our lives every time we make a mistake we shouldn't get despondent we shouldn't give up but actually we should just rise up again and try over and over and over again and continue to rise up but there's a deeper aspect to this too and this I find this to be like one of the most profound things at least for me it really speaks to me and Tanya is where the ultra Rebbe says that between level to level before reaching the higher level then a person is considered to be in a state of falling from the previous level. So, okay, so what does that mean? So that seems to be implying that in order to get to the next level, then there needs to be a fall that happens. There needs to be a breaking for some, on some, to some extent. So this actually reminds me of a tweet I read the other day, which is from this account that I follow called Orange Book, which is like different snippets of like daily wisdom. I'm not sure where they get the wisdom from or where, why it's called Orange Book exactly. But anyways, the tweet read, it's painful to end a relationship with an older version of yourself, but that's the price of growth. So I thought that was really deep. So I'll say that again. It's painful to end a relationship with your older self, but that's the price of growth. So think about that for a minute. I want everybody to think about maybe a time in your life where you really had to, in order to move on, in order to get to the next level in your life in some way, somehow, maybe it was moving to a different job. Maybe it was moving into a different kind of relationship. Maybe it was moving homes, moving cities, countries, whatever it is. There's a letting go that has to happen. And that letting go, even though you're moving to a higher level, there, that letting go can be very painful. And it's this painful, this pain is something real. And this is, this really is called a falling in a certain sense. Even though we're going higher, we do fall on some level. However, now the altar Rebbe gives us a little bit of solace. He says, Ki ipol lo ital. So this is a citation from Tehillim, uh, from chapter 17, verse 24, which means that even though he falls, he should not be ca ca cast down. Like, don't get despondent. Don't feel bad about this just because you're leaving one place and it might hurt a little bit and it might be considered like a falling. This is only called falling only in relation to the level before. But in relation to 
every other person, God forbid, this is not considered falling because you still like overall in the objective view of what's going on, you still actually are much higher than the others. So it's like you, you've object objectively actually risen from here, even though it does feel kind of like a fall because on some level, like when in your service, you took a fall, but really ultimately you did get to a higher level. So just to talk about this a little bit more. So this reminded me of like a lot of things. Like, so going back to my yoga practice, for example, is that whenever I'm advancing in my practice, so let's say I'm smooth sailing, I'm going along, you know, like let's say when I was in my power yoga class, that was going pretty well. But in order to advance to the next level, I had to take a fall. I had to humble myself. And every time I get a new pose in my yoga practice, I get that same experience. So it's like, I'll be feeling really strong. I'll be feeling really good about myself. But then I'll hit a new pose that's kind of like this roadblock. And it feels really impossible. And it feels very frustrating and very challenging. And I feel like I hit kind of this breaking point. And I feel like I'm going back to being a beginner once again. And I feel totally incompetent. And I don't know what I'm doing or whatever. But what the ultra is teaching us here is while it might be that be true in a sense that there is a certain fall involved in that growing process, really ultimately I'm actually much more advanced than I was way before, right? So we actually see this physiologically as well that very interestingly in order for muscles to grow in order to become stronger they actually have to tear first so like let's say if you're ever like lifting weights or doing push-ups or something like that and you start to notice that you're becoming stronger maybe your muscles are becoming tighter more toned bigger maybe so interestingly this interesting fact to know is that your muscles actually in order to get stronger in order to become bigger they actually have to tear first and only then can they build back up again so i think that this is also another example of how this process works of how there needs to be a fall in order to grow we also see this in terms of neuroplasticity, which is another topic which I love, which is the idea of neuroplasticity is how the brain, it used to be thought that we have like a limited number of brain cells and that's it. And like, there's no moving on from there. We can't actually uh, become a smarter or really go that much beyond our nature. But future research has really shown that there's this thing called neuroplasticity, which means that we're constantly developing new neural connections in our mind. And through this, we can actually really expand our thinking in really amazing ways, like really uh, almost miraculous kind of ways where people have been able to heal from strokes in this way and vertigo and all kinds of different things through this technique of neuroplasticity. And so and on a simple level, what neuroplasticity is, is that we can actually, where we have like a certain limit to our abilities, whether they're mental or physical, and then somehow through neuroplasticity, we're able to break through this limit and our limit becomes more expanded. It goes on to the next level. And so now, interestingly, the way that neuroplasticity actually happens is through making mistakes. So for example, again, I can relate it to my physical practice. So like if I'm learning handstands, for example, which is one of the things that I, I train. So actually the way that I'm going to learn how to do a handstand is actually through falling, interestingly enough. So it's really literally falling because every time I fall, then my brain is learning what it is that I'm doing wrong. And through that, hopefully it can self-correct and figure out how to fix it for next time, especially if you have a good coach, obviously, who's like leading you in the right direction. But so it's really through the mistakes that we do that this is where the learning happens. So it's not when you get the answer right. When you get the answer right, that's like the final product, but that's not where the learning happens. That's not where the neuroplasticity happens. The neuroplasticity happens in those mistakes, in those mess ups that happen to us. So also we see this like in terms of balance. If a person wants to really develop their sense of balance, then the way that they can do that is not by just doing simple balance exercises, but they have to constantly challenge themselves. So for example, if in the beginning, it's hard for you to just stand on one leg without falling, then go for it, do that. But once you get to the level where you can just stand on one leg really easily and comfortably, you're not actually working on your balance anymore when you do that. To really work on your balance, you need to challenge yourself. You might need to stand on like an unsteady surface. You might need to close your eyes, do something to shake up your balance, to make yourself fall, so to speak. So it's like 
in the growing process, we constantly need to be making ourselves fall. So while this is true in a physical sense, in terms of physical practice, this is true spiritually as well. This is true when we, in order to grow and, and become stronger in our habits, in our ethics, in our relationship with God, which is ultimately what we're talking about, we're going to find times of breakage. We're going to find times where we actually do mess up and where we do fall. But ultimately what the ultra is telling us is while this is true and this is very real, we are really, really growing. But so now to get back to our text and bring it back home is so this is what now we can understand what we were talking about in the very beginning about educating a child according to his youth so that even when he gets older, it won't leave from him. Because this is really what we're trying to cultivate in our youth, in ourselves as youthful people, as children, is this idea of a beginner mind, this idea of constantly having the sense of wonder, wonderment and constantly having the sense of humility and the sense of like not knowing and the sense of like really being at the first level. If we have the state not only when we're a kid, when we're a child, like when you teach children, those preschoolers about those animals, and they've never seen a cow before, they've never seen a cat before. That's amazing. That's great. We want them to have that same sense when they're older too, when they become biology students, neurobiology students, uh, zoologists, whatever it is. We don't want them to now think like, oh, now I know everything about a cat. Now I know everything about a cow. No, we want them to constantly be reaching that breaking point of, feeling like they know nothing, feeling like they're a beginner, but at the same time have this awareness of like, okay, but objectively you are moving, you are moving forward, you are getting better. And so now to bring it really into practicality, here how the ultra rabbit concludes this, is he says that the very the very first part, so we're talking about this idea of loving and fearing God. So it's like we went all over the place today in terms of different types of practices, physical practices, uh, habit practices, baseball, yoga, things like that. So here, really, Tanya, the focus of what type of practice discipline we're trying to cultivate is the discipline of loving and fearing God. And the foundation of this is this pure sense of faith in God, in God's oneness and in God's unity. And so this is why, so this is the segue that we're getting to the next section, which is Shari Yechud Amuna, which is going to talk all about this level of God's unity and oneness. So that was a lot. I know it was really long today. It's uh, not my fault. It's just a long section. I hope you stuck with it all. So if I could try to the best of my ability to sum this all up, because I know that there was a lot, a lot there, is that what what we're what we did today, basically, is we learned the entire introduction to the section called Shara HaYichud Vahamuna of the Tanya. Shara HaYichud Vahamuna of the Tanya talks about God's oneness and unity. It talks about the underlying, the spiritual underpinnings of creation and how the spiritual underpinnings of creation really all come back to God and God's unity and oneness. And we can see this in the Shema verse of the first par- paragraph of the Shema where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and then blessed is is the name of God. So, forever and ever. So, and we'll get into a lot of detail in the coming weeks talking about this, talking about God's unity and how it underlies all of creation and what that means exactly. And in today's introduction, we gave a, what the ultra was trying to do is he's trying to give us a sense as to why, why we're going to be learning about these things and the mindset that we should have in learning about these things. And the basic point is that the reason why we want to be learning about these things and the focus we should have in learning about God's unity and oneness is to cultivate a beginner's mind, is to really develop a sense of humility and develop a sense of wonderment, while at the same time a recognition that we are growing and that we are developing, specifically in terms of our love of God, and that the way that we can really, the focus of our lives, the focus, the true discipline of our lives, the true focus that our lives should have, should be in developing this, this relationship with our creator. So we have relationships with our parents, with our friends, with our family, all of those kind of things. But ultimately, the, the most important and the foundational relationship of all of these is our relationship with God. And so the way that we can have this relationship with God and the way that we can really deepen this relationship with God to its fullest extent, which is really what the Tanya is kind of trying to teach us how to do, is to try to strive and develop a discipline of loving God, just like we would have a discipline for any other type of thing, any other type of practice, whether it's yoga, handstands, baseball, 
paint, painting, what have you. So just like with any other type of discipline that we might have, we want to constantly have this sense of a, a beginner's mind and to have a, a very consistent and orderly practice. We see that this is something that we can have in terms of our discipline and practice of loving God too. And so what is the practice and what is the consistency in in this practice of loving God, it's studying chasaras and it's really studying and learning about God and learning about God's unity and oneness. And this is what we're going to be learning in the coming weeks in this next section. And the, and the primary thing that we need to keep in mind in doing this is to keep, is to stay alert to the beginner's mind, to really st- learn these things as a child would learn them in the sense that to not ever get to the point where you feel like you know everything or that you're in a place of stagnation. We need to constantly be growing. We need to constantly moving forward and constantly state and be in a state of humility and in a state of childlike wonderment and of the mindset of a beginner. So just like my yoga teacher said to me back then four years ago where he said, you should always think of yourself as a beginner just show up tomorrow at 9 a.m. when the beginners show up. That's what I'm going to give to you. All is to you listeners is that show up tomorrow, be with me, stick with me, be a beginner, think of yourself as a beginner, and I'll be there with you as well, thinking of myself as a beginner, because I know I definitely am. The more I do these podcasts, the more I realize just how much of a beginner I am with all of this material. There's just It's just infinite and if you think you understand something, you just realize how much more there is to understand. But at the same time, I've really been seeing, this is on a personal note, that while I, I, I see day after day how little I know and how much the more there is to understand and how little I understand, I also see how much I am learning. And I also see how much I am, the, these ideas are really shaping and, and integrating themselves and seeping into my everyday life. So I hope the same thing is true for you guys as well and i'd love to hear feedback and i'd love to hear questions and thoughts and everything you can post it on the youtube channel you can also uh send me messages if you feel more comfortable with that and i'd love to hear from you guys and stick with it it's it's a it's a great process and we will continue tomorrow when we begin very exciting i'll speak to you then thanks for listening to the it is top podcast hosted by sarit switzer this podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Abraham Yitzchak ben Benyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.